Welcome to Troutwood Live. I am Gene Natale with Troutwood. Every company and every person has a story. Each week we host a guest from a company in the S&P 500. We talk about that company, our guest's career within the company, and their own personal story. Today's guest lives in Pittsburgh, works for Amgen, and has a story that I believe all of you will find inspirational. The title and the topic is Self-Awareness is a Core Competency. Kevin Hu, welcome to Troutwood Live. Gene, good to see you. How are you doing? I'm doing excellent. And uh, Kev, I feel uh, obliged to share with our audience that you and I have known each other for quite a while. Uh, you are a very good friend, and I appreciate you being here today. 20 years, I think. 20 years since you uh, first hired me at Wildwood. That uh, went by in a snap of a finger, <laughs> didn't it? <laughs> it did. Kev, tell us about yourself. Yeah, so I am... Uh, I am originally from Pittsburgh, uh, went to school in Fox Chapel. I now live in the North Allegheny area. Um, and I work for a company called Amgen. They're a biotech that's based out in Southern California. And I work in particular on the commercial side. So um, I'm in the commercial leadership program, which is a post MBA three year program that's designed to position graduates for future leadership in the commercial side of the company. And all that really means is that the commercial side takes the work our researchers do when it comes to medications and treatments and makes it accessible to the patients who need it. Um, and uh, fortunately, I, fortunately, I've been able to work remotely, come back to Pittsburgh um, and spend some time with uh, the grandparents and the parents and uh, take advantage of everything that Pittsburgh has to offer. So we're really excited to talk to the audience today and uh, just to answer any questions and talk a little bit about what Amgen does and how we do it. So, Kevin, I'm gonna take a look at the Troutwood map. We're gonna fly into Amgen's headquarters and take a look at it, because you, you had mentioned the word remote. You are here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Amgen, however, is over in Thousand Oaks, California. For our educators uh, listening in and tuning in, the fun fact for Amgen, kind of a neat one and certainly relevant. The ABE educational program is designed to teach students about biotechnology. And this program has impacted more than 600,000 students. Uh, shout out, great work, Amgen. And let's take a look at, at this great company that, that Kevin works for. Um, Kevin, that's uh, our, our old lifeguard days. We'd have a different fact sheet, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so I encourage everyone to, to check out Amgen. Uh, Kevin's going to inspire you. I'm going to share and, you know, we'll, we'll come to this Amgen Explore Careers here uh, later on in the presentation. I'm going to tease to our audience, everyone listening, I was at Kevin's West Point graduation. And Kevin, of everyone that I personally know in my network, I think before we dive into your presentation, it's worth just you know, 30 to 60 seconds, your path to West Point was not the traditional one. The fair You're absolutely point. right. Yeah. Yeah, I graduated high school in 2003, and I was actually well into my junior year at the University of Pittsburgh when I enlisted in the Army in 2006. And what makes that story particularly interesting, I think I get a lot of questions about, is um, I actually was recommended for uh, attendance to West Point. So I applied while I was in basic training, uh, completed it, and two months later showed up at West Point for cadet basic training. So that was not a fun uh, couple months for me, having to do basic training twice. Um, but it's certainly, I think, a really, a, you know, really, I think we'll talk about it in the presentation itself, but it's very interesting to focus on how um, I made such a big transition from being at the University of Pittsburgh being ready to graduate, and then making this transition to the military. And I think what's so relevant to the topic that you've selected to talk about with us today, self-awareness is a core competency. So many students in my observation and experiences feel the pressure to at least, you know, give off the impression they know the specific path. There is no specific path. Uh, what a great example of that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's something that will really come out and be highlighted today because uh, the journey I've taken to Amgen is certainly non-traditional and I should take away some of the fear for people who are still at the point in their lives where they're really wondering, what the heck am I going to do and how do I get there? Um, because 
the answer is there's no straight path. Removing fear, Kevin, I like that. Let, let's dive into your presentation. Yeah, absolutely. So we, Gene, thanks for teeing up some of the information here about Amgen. And you know what I'll just add to that is um, Amgen really focuses on those diseases where there are a limited number of treatment options. And that's usually due to the complexity of the disease. And for example, you know, despite the billions of dollars and decades that we spent on cancer research, cancer is still the second leading contributor to deaths in the United States. And the top two leading cause of cancer death are lung and colon. And these are areas where Amgen scientists are actively engaging in research. Mm -hmm. um, if you flip to the next slide, what I will say is that our treatments do cover a wide variety of therapeutic areas, as you can see. Uh, but some of our more recent innovations that you may have seen on cable television um, really include Amavig for migraine sufferers and Otesla for psoriasis. Um, psoriasis. And the reason we can do this is because we have a specific specialty in using living systems and organisms to make our medicines. Um, traditionally, most pharmaceutical companies use a chemical process. But what we do is we actually draw upon our understanding of the human genome and genetic engineering to utilize nature in developing treatments against these complex diseases. And Gene, when I was thinking about how to really describe what it is that Amgen does, I actually thought that our mission statement does a great job of summarizing it. And here's what it says. Our company strives to serve patients by transforming the promise, promise of science and biotechnology into therapies that have the power to restore health or save lives. And so this is in everything we do, we aim to fulfill our mission to serve patients. To me, this is a really powerful mission statement because it gives me a distinct purpose when I wake up in the morning and a chance for reflection when I go to bed. And basically what I ask myself is, what am I going to do today? And what did I do today to improve patient lives? So Gene, if you Kevin, switch over. Let me just ask a question to help quantify for a student audience, because right at, you got my attention immediately when you said we're fighting cancer. That's a disease that a lot of us here in America can relate to in different ways. And when you say a, a patient of Amgen's, you're referring to what? Yes. So I'm referring to um, specifically, you know, a really good example might be colon cancer. There are a lot of people who have colon cancer. I think it's the second most prevalent um, cancer in the United States. And Unfortunately, it's one of those diseases where there aren't a lot of treatment options available. And so what Amgen really considers their patients is anyone that has colon cancer, and specifically anyone who has a specific variant of colon cancer that can be targeted by one of our therapies called Vectivix. Um, our job is to ensure that those patients have the ability to get access to Vectivix. And if it has the ability to improve their lives, um, and make a difference, then we've done our job. That patient now has a better chance of um, dealing with their disease because we've given them a product that they can use. Kevin, you've, you've got my attention immediately. If I'm a student and says this, I'm interested. I want to help in this fight against cancer. I want to help in this fight against colon cancer. I always think doctor, but I'm gonna guess that that's not what you're referring to when you're talking Amgen and patient. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is one of these areas that, this is why I became so interested in the biotechnology space. Um, you know, a physician is able to make a significant difference in one patient at a time. But when you think about what we can do with biotech, we have the ability to change, excuse me, to change the livelihoods for thousands or millions of people who are suffering from a disease. Mm -hmm. And that I think is really impactful. So it's not just our research team, which is in the lab, running the experiments, trying to figure out what we can do to target these diseases, but also applies to what we do on the commercial side. Because it's one thing to develop a treatment in a lab, but it's a whole nother thing to be able to get it into the hands of the patients. Um, I think a lot of people have heard about how complex our healthcare system is in the United States. Um, and getting it into the hands of patients is not always an easy process. And so our job is really to bridge that gap, make sure that as soon as it gets out of the lab, physicians know about it and that it gets in patients' hands uh, because there are a lot of people every day who are suffering and our job is to make sure we cut that amount of time um, as, as much as possible.
Interesting. I'll try not to interrupt Kevin. I'm bad at it, but I'm, I'll, I'm gonna <laughs> more time. I will, I, now I'm going to immediately reverse that. I do have one yeah. question, then we'll get back to your presentation. Yeah. If I want to be a part of this, this fight against cancer, this fight against these diseases or this, you know, helping millions of people like you alluded to, I don't have to just be a biology or a chemistry major interested in the research side. Is that fair to say there's a lot of avenues? Absolutely. And I think we're going to talk about one of them right now. I am ex-military. I spent eight years in the military and nothing in that, nothing in my experience really tied into biotechnology. And so for me, it's been a very big transition, but a lot of my peers who are also in the same program as I am have a variety of backgrounds. Some come from finance, um, some also come from marketing, but they come from a variety of industries. I think one of them actually worked, used to work for Coca-Cola. So there is a breadth of experience. Um, and frankly, Amgen really cares less about what you did before but focuses more on the talents that you bring and what you can contribute to the future. And I think that's the strength of working in Amgen or in any company in the biotechnology space. Very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Gene, I thought it'd be interesting if we have flipped to the next slide and uh, kind of give a little bit of context, I think, just in terms of um, developing self-awareness and my journey to Amgen. Um, so cover back on that question about why I made the transition to the military. I think this graph here says it all. And you don't really need to know the specifics of the graph, but what you can see is this shows a month to month portrayal of the number of attacks happening in Iraq between 2004 on your left and 2007 on your right. And what you can clearly see is that around 2005, the situation in Iraq had really deteriorated with a number of attacks increasing very dramatically. And as someone who can remember watching the September 11th attacks as a high school student, I recognized what was happening in Iraq and regardless of the politics associated with our involvement in the country, I realized that there was an urgent need for volunteers who were willing to make a difference on the ground. Um, what I will say, you know, as we talked about before, my life did take a very interesting turn when I was recommended and accepted at West Point. A lot of people ask me, why I went back to school so quickly, and it really ties into what I consider the first piece of developing self-awareness, which is understanding your strengths and weakness, weaknesses. Mm. As a suburban kid growing up in Pittsburgh with no exposure to the military, I really felt acutely that I lacked military experience and knowledge. And I felt that four more years at West Point would really help take the edge off. Um, go ahead, yeah, Gene. With the slide that you have up right now, just to what year did you enroll at the University of Pittsburgh? And then what year did you start at West Point? Yeah, so 2003, so it's off of, off of this slide, was 2003 is when I started at Pittsburgh. And then around 2005, 2006 is when you can see right in the middle, I think um, you can see this, the curve just start going up. And you know, that's when the situation is really deteriorating. And that's when I was thinking to myself, I'm here at University of Pittsburgh. I really love what I have going on but this is gonna be one of the few opportunities where I feel like something needs to be done and they need boots on the ground to help make things better for the people on the ground. And I'll, I'll tease our students um, and don't give the answer just yet, but I know one of our local hometown Steeler players he ended up meeting at West Point, which is a pretty good story that we can <laughs> share, share later on in our conversation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, you know, if we switch to the next slide, you know, four years later, I graduated commission as an Army Infantry Lieutenant. And along the way, while I was at West Point, I learned that I really enjoyed working on challenging problems. And I also really enjoyed working on challenging problems with talented people. I also found out that I really disliked working on any problem with people that I did not think were committed to the job of the hand, regardless of what kind of problem it was. And this is a crucial piece of insight that would later drive my decision to go to Amgen. Um, I also found out that I was really terrible at gymnastics. This was my first time getting a C minus in any class, and I passed on the last day with two points. <laughs> so I do want to highlight, you know, there is a picture missing from this frame. Gene, I know you were there at graduation, and I spent 30 minutes trying to find a picture of us from that day. So if you have one, please send it to me because I went nuts trying to look for it. I'm sure I have a picture <laughs> I vividly remember. And I also remember the fantastic dinner we had uh, that evening. Right. <laughs> uh, 
So after I graduated from West Point, part of understanding myself also meant finding out how I would perform in the worst situations possible. So we take a look at this next slide here. Um, what I did is I attended Army Ranger School, which is a 60 day course designed to identify and develop combat leaders under conditions simulating um, combat. So what do conditions simulating combat mean? It means that we're running patrols 20 hours a day, getting two to three hours of sleep, and carrying around an 80 to 100 pound rucksack the entire time. We're also eating about 1500 calories a day and then burning twice that amount. And we were doing these patrols in uh, the woodlands of the mountains in Dahlonega, Georgia, and then also my least favorite, the swamps in the Florida Panhandle. So none of these pictures here include me, but these are all pictures from Ranger School. And what I can tell you from just looking at them, and if you take a look at them, everyone here looks absolutely miserable. And I can tell you from personal experience that they are. But what is great about this experience is that it taught me something else valuable about myself, which is that I was really good at designing plans. I love to sit there, design plans that could be executed and watch them be executed very well. And so even though I was good at excelling at executing plans on the ground, I naturally gravitated towards designing and building plans uh, for whatever we we're doing that day, whether it was a simulated raid on a, a drug depot, whether it was a rescue of a downed pilot, you name it. I love just helping to be a part of the building and designing plan process. So if you take a look at the next slide, uh, my reward for graduate range school was a 50 cent piece of cloth on my shoulder. And uh, in the process, I lost 40 pounds. So I don't think a lot of people have seen this picture, but this is the after. This is what I look like when I'm about 150 pounds. <laughs> so in addition to understanding my strengths and weaknesses, I would say my military experience also taught me how to understand the people around me. So during my first deployment to Afghanistan in 2012, I was on a civil military operations team that led efforts to build uh, what we call the Afghan Local Police Program. So Gene, if you could switch to the next slide here. So this program was designed to enable local villages to build their own security forces, uh, create stability, and allow American troops to be withdrawn from the areas where the local police were operating. So for those yeah, of you- Are you in not, this picture? Are you one of the individuals? No, so the picture, there's only one picture that I'm allowed to show. And I would love to be able to show some of the other ones, but um but you know these pictures here uh, give you a really good idea of what afghanistan is like in the area that we were operating um it's a beautiful country but conditions are really austere so if you're stationed at a combat combat outpost like the one on the left hand side of the screen you're going to be digging a trench and you're going to be doing your business in that trench there's no running water there's no toilet your bed is a cot with no padding and your hot meals are pretty few and far between there are also too many jobs and not enough people to do them. So knowing the people around you and how they operate is really critical to getting the job done. So I'm going to give you one example from this experience. So one of the challenges we faced was figuring out how to get ammunition resupplied to our Afghan partners. And this was a challenge because we were about to enter fighting season and we were expecting them to burn through ammunition quickly. But I knew from experience that ammunition resupply could take anywhere from weeks to months. And this is primarily due to slow reporting of ammunition consumption. So here's how it works. You shoot 10 bullets, you ask for 10 bullets. In the Amazon world, those bullets show up on your doorstep that same day. But in if Afghanistan, you're lucky to even get those bullets. So the problem was we were relying on these villagers to report their consumption via paperwork forms. What we failed to understand is that most of this country is illiterate and asking an illiterate person to write and read was not the right solution. Oftentimes, rather than admitting that they could not read or write, the villagers actually preferred to not say anything at all. So we failed to understand our teammates and how they operated, and it took us months to come to this realization. You know, fortunately, in the end, we changed the reporting process so that it was all done via radio to the district headquarters, so where we could expect that there was probably someone who could read or write and transcribe what the villagers were telling them into these requisition forms. So this is really what I think the second piece of key piece of self-awareness is, which is you have to understand your teammates and how they operate and how to best leverage their strengths and weaknesses. Gene, I know we're running a little bit on time. If you want, I can keep going. I just don't want to. Uh, keep going. Cause, well, what's interesting, Kevin, because as you're talking, 
I'm tying into, I'm imagining myself being in a classroom talking with students. Yeah. You gave a real life supply chain problem that you had to solve while active duty. And I'm guessing that that experience of the planning, the problem solving um, makes you more effective in your job today. Absolutely. And I think this was a really, this even ties back to the first point, which is, you know, understanding yourself. I love to plan. I love to create plans. Um, and now is really taking it to the next step and saying, how can I create plans, effective plans, and make them work with a partner, someone that I have to be able to work with and get their support from? Mm -hmm. um, you know, at the end of the day, that's what happened. We designed a plan in which we said, hey, you have a supply chain problem, but what's working on the ground or what is happening right now clearly is not working. So let's figure out something new, but give it to you in a way that you can effectively execute it because what we gave you before clearly was not the solution. Mm -hmm. Kevin, I jumped ahead in your presentation to a beautiful glass building, um, <laughs> picking in the theme of, of problem solving. And if I, if I was in the classroom right now, boy, the assignments you can give to, to get anything, the glass windows to this beautiful building, where were they manufactured? Who did it take to build them? How did they get here? It's a fascinating field that doesn't get talked about often. Absolutely. And, you know, if you really like working on complex problems, you can find them anywhere. You know, it's not just supply chain, but there are lots of puzzles that are in the commercial space in the real world where the answers, you know, are not easy to find. And so I'd encourage anyone who's, um, you know, figuring out what they want to do, take time to think about what kind of problems you really like solving. And that doesn't necessarily mean you know, I like working in tech or like I like working in the medical field. It can actually mean I really like working on challenging complex problems that require a lot of brain power to solve. And if you gravitate towards that, find a company that allows you to do it. I appreciate that. Kev. That's a great statement. So I think we'll, how are we doing on time, Gene? We can back up and go to uh, keep on going with the presentation. We, so we're, we've got about five minutes left, Kev. I would love you to explain what this picture is on the screen <laughs> um, because it looks really fun. And I think when we can blend fun and finance, fun and career exploration, we've done something yeah. really good. Yeah. So, you know, this is a photo of my, uh, my section or the group of people that I was closest with in my business school program. You know, this is really for me the one of the final pieces of my transition where I knew that I'd spent a ton of time in the military, but I knew nothing about finance. I knew nothing about marketing or strategy. And I felt that spending two years at an MBA program, learning about these kind of aspects of the commercial world would help me a lot in transition to any type of space that I did, not just biotechnology. But you know, for anyone who's considering, excuse me, going to an MBA program, it's a great opportunity to meet with people who come from very different backgrounds, very different occupations, and exchange a lot of different ideas and thoughts about how the world um, works and how it operates. So I had a great two years there, and it was probably one of the, uh, a really big reason for why, you know, I ended up deciding to go into biotech because um, I had a lot of exposure to people who are working in the biotech space and in medicine. Kevin, your story is so fascinating. You know, Pittsburgh, you know, University of Pittsburgh to West Point to all over the world as an active duty a member of our military to Northwestern Business School. There is there is no quit in you. <laughs> you know what? It's uh, I think, as you know, my wife would put it, it'll be nice to settle down at, in one place with one company for at least a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you found you found a good one with Amgen and. Kev, we have some questions that I'd like to start to dive into. I think yeah, absolutely some excellent questions. Uh, the, the first one, you, you kind of answered early on, but it's a very direct question. How have biopharmaceuticals improved our lives? Yeah. You know, I would say one addition I would like to make is that um, the more complex the disease is, sometimes but not always the more complex the treatment needs to be and you know we're used to thinking about medications in terms of something like an aspirin right you take a pill out of a bottle 
Um, it's a chemical compound and you know, it's, it's pretty easy to manufacture. But for some of these complex diseases, um, the cures we found more and more can be created by our own bodies. We have inbuilt mechanisms designed to find cancer cells, target them and destroy them. And one of the beautiful aspects of biotechnology is as we've come to better understand our bodies, human genetics, the human genome, we're starting to get to the point where we can leverage those tools in our fight against these complex diseases. And that's where biotechnology has made a big difference. It's given us the ability to create tools that we just didn't have before um, when it comes to medicine. Kevin, is there an example of a biopharmaceutical product that maybe our listeners and our watchers would understand or resonate with? You know, I, I'll actually go back and talk about um, one that I was recently working on, which is Vectivix. And it's been around for a while, but um, colon cancer, number two leading cause of cancer deaths in the United States. Um, really big impact in what really big impact in the medical field. What we were able to identify was a particular mutation in some patients who had colon cancer. And this mutation made them more likely to have um, a more aggressive form of colon cancer. What we did was we were able to identify that mutation and then we were able to develop a treatment that specifically targeted that mutation. And what it does is it prevents that particular genomic mutation from sending its signal to tell cells to continue dividing, which is what happens as most basic form of cancer, uncontrolled cell division. Um, so, you know, I hopefully, you know, no one's ever in a position where they have to hear Vectivix. But, you know, that's just one example of a really great treatment that when we combine it with chemotherapy, and existing, existing forms of cancer therapy, it's done a great job of actually extending patients' lives, and in some cases, um, putting, cancer, putting colon cancer um, into remission. But I think it's just one step in a very long path that we currently have in the fight against cancer. But every step matters. Absolutely. Kevin, I'm gonna to jump to a, a, a question that came in from our live audience that I think is a, is a really good one here, a great individual to answer it. Can you please expand on, you know, if you were talking to a student audience, which you are, uh, can you expand on the importance of developing self-awareness as students, uh, you know, look ahead and plan their own future? Yeah, absolutely. I think that is a really, really hard question in the sense that if I think about where I was it, as an 18 year old, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my future. I think it's very easy to, you know, I think a lot of times we think of our careers and our development as a straight point from A to B. And this kind of assumes that our values never change, that our experiences are all similar. So what I would advise is that what most people want to find out is that in between A to B, you have a lot of experiences that really change and shape your values. So for example, coming out of high school, didn't really know what I want to do, but I had experiences in the military. I went overseas quite a bit and had encounters with, you know, different people who thought about the world or with people who thought differently about the world than the way I did. I had a lot of experiences with healthcare professionals while I was overseas. Those all kind of shaped how I thought about myself and what I wanted to do. So at end state, be open to the idea that what you, that there's, you shouldn't really expect to get from A to B immediately. Be open to the possibility that new experiences will change and shape your values as you get older. I think very few of my classmates, even in the military or at West Point or even at Pitt, are doing the things that they thought they were going to do on their first day of college. So be open to those, to the possibility of change and how it affects you. That's a great statement, Kev. Kevin, what, 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 if a student wanted to learn more about Amgen, uh, is there anywhere you would suggest they turn to research the company? No, abs absolutely. Um, you know, Amgen is now one of the, uh, is now a Dow Jones industrial component. We just got added a couple months ago. Um, so any Google search, you, know, you can definitely find out quite a bit of information about Amgen. But if you're interested in what happens from, 
you know, a month to month, uh, quarter to quarter basis. Uh, it sounds boring, but the quarterly reports, um, the first few pages really do a great job of talking about some of the research that Amgen has been doing and then the commercial efforts we're making to um, get that research into um, into patients' hands. So Google Amgen uh, quarterly report or even annual report, and you can find some really great information about what Amgen has been doing. I love that, Co. And what, so just, um, <clears throat> I'm gonna go to our last question here, just in the essence of time. Yeah, what, absolutely. What, what does a commercial leadership team do? Let's just, you know, yeah. kind of give us 30 seconds on your specific role and your team's role. Absolutely. So uh, I'll expand a little bit and just talk about the rotational program a bit. Um, but there's so many different areas of healthcare. So they include value and access, right? Which is basically how do you create value for all the different stakeholders in the, in the healthcare chain, for the patients, for the doctors, for the nurses, for the company, for the manufacturers. And that's a really big piece of the puzzle. How do you create value? There's also, um, you know, there's also part of my team that focuses on delivering an effective message and patient education. So we're asking patients to take really, in some cases, complex medications. They're not pills, they're injectables. And so there have to be, there has to be very good patient education to say, hey, this is what you're getting, this is how you take it, these are potential side effects, and these are how you deal with the side effects. So these are all different components that I think the team is working on, but I would say broadly, anything that involves um, taking a treatment outside of the laboratory and getting into the hands of patients really covers all of that. Um, we specifically on my team do a lot of interactions with the healthcare providers to educate them on, um, on treatments because sometimes you think about healthcare providers, they're busy. They don't have time to read about the journal articles. They don't have time to follow along with the latest research. They just need someone to interface with them and say, hey, this is what it does. This is how, what it can do for your patients. And this is how you can deliver it successfully to your patients. And we walk it through them so that they don't have to deal with all the friction points associated with figuring out how to get the treatment into the hands of the patients. Kevin, I'm going to help support that statement. I'm going to bring up the, the Troutwood map uh, in the screen here. And we're going to go look at the, I was on Amgen's career section earlier, which can be accessed um, by our company fact sheets. And to your point, in our earlier conversation, for students looking to explore careers, look how cleverly the company outlines the areas, research and development. And, five boxes to explore, operations, if I'm not interested in the research side, global, commercial, I want to travel, corporate, finance, um, up there, and look at that right there, veteran opportunities. Yeah. Um, really, really cool. Yeah. I, 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 we would be remiss. Uh, we teased this story earlier. I think it's a fantastic way to end our, our conversation here. Can you share your, uh, I had alluded that while you were able to meet a, one of our local kind of celebrity NFL Steeler, yeah. Steeler players. So this is, uh, depending on how you think about it, this is probably a fun memory for him, but a little bit of an embarrassing memory for me. So um, Alejandro Villanueva, left tackle for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, he, uh, we were in the same class at West Point and uh, during one of our training exercises um, after West Point, we we're out in the woods and we're taking simulated incoming artillery fire. So when you take incoming artillery fire, you have one job, which is to run a certain distance away um, from the artillery fire, seek cover, and then eventually regroup at a common point. So I'm running away and I'm carrying about 80 pounds on my back. So running's not the right word. I'm shuffling along as quickly as I can. And I come across this tree. It's a really long tree. I, you know, it's maybe it's like half the length of the swimming pool, right? And it's chest high. So I'm looking at this thing and I'm thinking, how the heck do I get over this? I'm going to have to go all the way around it just to keep going forward. So I'm just kind of standing there looking at it, feeling really sorry for myself. And Alejandro Villanueva comes bounding out of the woods. He's carrying the 80 pounds on his back. He's also carrying a machine gun in his arms. It's a 20 pound machine gun with bandoliers of ammunition strung around his neck. <laughs> sees me, sees the tree, 
jumps while or while running jumps and clears the tree in one bound <laughs> he's running to the woods turns around looks at me and just smirks <laughs> so i don't know what my face looked like but i'm pretty sure my mouth was open and there's a reason he's a uh, starting left tackle in the nfl <laughs> and i'm uh, and i'm not <laughs> i love that story Kev, as we wind down, I always like to conclude by asking our guest um, if there is any advice that you would give to your younger self. You were sitting in that that classroom still, uh, something you wished you would have known when you were a student. I think it just ties back to what we've had this to discussion that we've had the whole time, which is um, take some time to reflect on what your strengths and weaknesses are but understand that those change over time. Your values change over time and your experiences that you will have will adjust what those strengths and weaknesses are. So be open to that possibility of change and don't feel as if while you're sitting there in the classroom that you need to have your life mapped out for the next 10 or 20 years. Um, everyone does that, but few people actually follow that path. Those are words that I think are important for students to hear. Wise words from a wise man. <laughs> Evan, uh, on behalf of our student and our educator audience, thank you. On behalf of everyone at Trowood, thank you. And to everyone tuning in, thank you for watching and uh, listening to Trowood Live. See you next time. Thanks, Gene.